Can grab it. All right, I hit it. I hope that's that's the thing. I always love this first part where like everyone confirms and then that's at the beginning of the recording. Excellent. All right. So my name is Brian Oladike, BTO Pro. I had a lot of candy because I have to. It's kind of a requirement before I do any talk because I try to talk really fast. So as I said in uh, DrupalCon uh, in April, let's do this. All right. So what are we here to talk about today? Uh, technology called hacks. So if you could use the hashtag hacks the web uh, on social media, I would really appreciate it. Uh, kind of spread the word about what's what you're going to see here. Um, and please, we're always super open to getting involved uh, with other people and getting, you know, a community around this technology uh, as part of the Drupal community and, you know, other communities. So, all right, you skipped ahead, Brian. What the heck is Hacks? So Hacks is uh, short for Headless Authoring Experience. Uh, so first, let's back up then. What is Authoring Experience? Well, Authoring Experience is the fact that contributors are users too. So with Drupal especially, we're building a system for people to input content to deploy the content out to others, right? And you love your contributors, don't you? Can't <laughs> you give them this, okay? This is a WYSIWYG editor, a terrible one. I believe this is a screenshot of uh, uh, Terrible Press, I think it's called. But um, so if you wanna do anything advanced in Terrible Press, what you end up doing is something like this. You have these really, awesome little brackety things. We've used them for a long time. And uh, to quote uh, the great philosopher, Michael Potter, uh, what is this again, folks? This is total anarchy, okay? This is the body field. And there's all these arguments about the way we'll manage the body field because it is total anarchy. When you put these little snippets in, you're kind of constraining the anarchy, but not really. You're kind of letting people do whatever they want. So everyone's attempting to control the anarchy. And so another method of controlling anarchy that we've devised is to create templates. And if we just, if we create the HTML ahead of time, because we know, but we know exactly what our content contributors want, then they won't screw things up. They'll, they'll, they'll put things in the page and then they just will never edit them. Except that's not what happens. Otherwise we would have stopped here. We wouldn't have had to keep going. So what does keep going look like? Well, if you're in WordPress land, there's this thing called Divi, um, which is yeah, like layers of anarchy and hell mixed together. Um, or if you're in Drupal, you know, cause I don't want to just pick on WordPress, there's other layers of anarchy and hell mixed together um, or, or yet other layers of, of hell anarchy. Um, but we're trying really hard to get out of the hell anarchy. I, I'm totally, I'm all about this, not to de deface, you know, uh, anyone that has worked on these projects, it's just, we're all searching for a solution and, and everybody keeps moving around other things. So like clearly we all haven't found it yet. Um, and in Drupal 8 land, we've got this, right? So we've got a layout editor that's being built. It's pretty, pretty good initiative as well. Um, if you're in WordPress land, you've got this, it's uh, Gutenberg. Uh, maybe you've heard of it. It's a huge problem. Because in the Drupal land, we have pretty crappy authoring experience overall, don't we? Um, and what's funny is even seeing the way the WordPress community has reacted to this effort, uh, there's kind of this fork of like, whoa, wait a minute, I, I, we did things this other way and then we taught our contributors X and now they create things in Y. I don't know if this is the way we wanna go. So really we're all toying with improving authoring experience, right? These are just some examples because the WYSIWYG is total anarchy and we've gotta get away from total anarchy. We've all agreed with that. So unpopular opinion alert. All of this is awful. Uh, what we end up doing with our content management solutions is we end up building all of these ways to build other ways to build other ways to build other ways. And it's not really helping things at, at scale. Um, and so if you're a project manager uh, at, you know, a, a Drupal shop or whatever, it's not that I'm knocking these solutions. It's that you have to realize, especially in government and education, you are like one little drop in our ocean of Drupal that we manage. And so when you give us a panel site or you give us a paragraph site, we've now got to learn and manage paragraph sites and um, keep track of the fact that they're not panel sites, but then do this other one over here in Twig, but then use Layout Builder over here. And so it's the at scale part uh, that becomes really problematic. And so if you don't believe me, well, that's fine. Um, st statistics shall not lie here, is um, this is still the state of 
of Drupal usage. Um, D7 is starting to finally come down a little bit, which is honestly like, it's kind of a good thing, right? We're several, several years now into the D8 release cycle. And you're really not seeing uh, mass, the mass adoption numbers and people migrating over. And I, I contend it's because of this. We've tried to find all these different ways of constraining the anarchy. And then we've actually constrained ourselves into different forms of anarchy. And so um, to, to quote a colleague of mine, um, and I just you know, kind of pose this to you, is to challenge your assumptions about what it is you've been building and why. Is uh, why should Drupal care about your design? Why, sh why should it care at all? Because all these systems are attempting to allow content contributors to build out uh, designed things, but why? Why should Drupal be involved in this process at all? It's kind of what we're going to attempt to unpack here. So I'm going to kind of provide an anti-pattern to all of these is I, I want the content management system to just be assumed um, and I want it to learn the design. I want to just purely build design assets and, and design things uh, from static prototypes, if you will. And I want a content management system to just realize what they are and just work. Um, and so, you know, if we could do that, then we could all play nicely together, right? As opposed to like these three different camps of the way which you build out a Drupal site. And then like the 40, I couldn't put enough WordPress little figurines on here to count the number of endless ways of doing a WordPress site. So from our author's perspective and the people contributing to our sites, they really just want, they just want to learn one thing and not have to think again. And so that one thing is what we're attempting to build. Uh, it's a project called the headless authoring experience. And so what is hacks? We're gonna fire into the fake hacks pitch. I know, all right, hacks is the ultimate Drupal 6 authoring experience. Okay, <laughs> I know you haven't seen this since April. This is phenomenal. Okay, we're not gonna do that. Uh, so for starters, I can't install Drupal 6 anymore because of PHP 7 and I, so I can't really do that joke anymore. Um, but so, Instead, skip ahead, you know, you could go back and watch a DrupalCon talk where I went on this whole rant about this, but if you go and get the web components module from Drupal.org and you go and get the hacks module from Drupal.org, you can skip to the chase and see that there's a Drupal 6 and a 7 and an 8 module. And so we'll kind of kill that joke and skip to the real hacks pitch, okay? So the real pitch as to why hacks instead of why all of myriad of other options out there is that what we're building does not require a framework uh, or is not pegged to one system. We're trying to just use the web as the platform to build against. And so you might ask yourself, wait, what is the platform? Um, and so I would say again, the web is the platform. And so the web is the platform uh, means that there is a, a four part specification that allows you as a developer to be in control of HTML to a level that is kind of unbelievable. Um, so forever we've built things in div tags, and paragraphs and spans and blink tags, obviously, uh, and marquee, right? As someone will say, but, uh, so this allows us to create our own new HTML tags that the browser goes, Oh, I understand the definition of that. And so then I will put down all of these other tags in its place. And so following this four part specification, we can do that. Uh, and it works across browsers. So if you go to webcomponents.org, you can learn more about this uh, in detail and why, you know, why we've selected it. But uh, why did we select it, right? So um, why web components? There's other component types of architecture out there. So we needed design and component uniformity in what we were building. And that can sound like a bad thing, but it's not really. Like if you think of every project you do, you are going for some level of conformity and consistency. Uh, so as an example, uh, let's say that we wanted a blue link on the page uh, that went to a location and had a name. And forever we, you know, copy and pasted this. And so then someone else is reading it and goes, oh, oh, I see what they did here. They div, awesome. Okay. Uh, however, wouldn't it be easier if, if you just had something that did that automatically, right? So if we were able to make a my button that went to link.com, and then it had the name tag, you know, name text in it and we were done. That would be a lot easier, right? You could plug that style in automatically. Someone wouldn't have to potentially screw up the syntax of doing that. So what that actually leads you to beyond conformity is sustainability. And you might be asking yourself, 
sustainable. What? Well, this is uh, sustainability. I'll show you why through a silly example here. So uh, if I had an awesome hyphen explosion tag, that is way more semantic than all that div, IMG, SRC gobbledygook. Uh, not just to you and me, but to our content contributors. Our content contributors, when they have to interface with HTML, are going to throw up if they have to learn what an IMG SRC is. It's, it's a fact, you can look it up. Uh, so what that tag is effectively is whatever we want it to be. So we're teaching the browser at runtime what an awesome hyphen explosion is. And if we have that concept in our toolkit, we can scrape out the guts of awesome explosion and turn it into anything. But everywhere that we've referenced an awesome explosion is still gonna show up the way that we've said. And so that's, that's sustainability. If I were to give my content contributors a, uh, an image tag and a template, you know, a WYSIWYG template, and they put it down 50 times, and oh shoot, we don't use that class name anymore. Or oh shoot, we, don't, we didn't have alt text that was defined by default that you know, made sense. Now you're gonna have people go and comb back through all of that garbage, trying to find the one class name or the one alt tag, uh, versus if it was an awesome explosion or if it was a my button, you could update that after the fact or put advanced logic into parts of the page that have been rolled out into production years later. So this also has huge implications for accessibility. So if we have the ability to make our own tags um, and it, it operates just like HTML, so we can put other tags in, in new these new tags we make, we can keep stacking up and up and up and up and up and build crazy things. Uh, so this is something uh, Nikki, uh, Nikki Misara Kaufman, who's part of our team is working on. Um, and so imagine if we just kept taking all those divs and spans and then wiring, in, wiring them into custom uh, tags and then put those custom tags in other custom tags. What if we just put one tag on the page and it, it cranked out an amazing accessible video player? Well, that's, that's what we're doing. Um, so this is an example of what that will end up ultimately looking like is that you will reference, you know, in this case, it's three tags, I apologize. Um, three tags that you could reference and have a, a pretty awesome video player just happen, right? There, there's groups that pay whole companies just for this one type of a player, uh, but ours are free. So what about developer experience? Right, so that layer, we've been talking about authoring experience and you're probably asking yourself, unless you know what hacks is, what the heck are, okay. Um, we're in web components part of the talk here. So, so what about developer experience? Well, developer experience on this thing is pretty much why we went this way. So um, in that awesome hyphen explosion, I'm gonna break what that looks like to the browser down real quick. So in that awesome hyphen explosion, you basically tell the, the web page, hey, Here's the definition for an awesome hyphen explosion. It's often hyphen, awesome hyphen explosion.html. And then inside of that, what does that look like? Well, you can have references to other um, HTML assets, you know, other custom elements, whatever you want, just like you can a normal web page. And then we start to go down from there. We get into uh, the template aspect of the specification for building. And so the template is just a tag that says, hey, hold on to this content and I will tell you what I want it to be used. And so these two right here, you can see this you know, DOM module ID equals awesome explosion. We're effectively teaching the browser, hey, whenever you see a awesome hyphen explosion tag, I need you to take the guts of what's between these template areas and I need you to put them in its place. Then we can write CSS, but because of the custom element and shadow DOM specs, which are part of this specification, we can write amazingly simple CSS. Uh, so we eliminated SAS from our build routines as part of this process. Uh, now you can still use SAS if you want to, um, but you can create selectors uh, that are specific to the thing you're working on. So you no longer have to write like 7,000 <laughs> line long class name selectors written in BEM format just to make sure that you get a box to be blue instead of orange. So uh, another part of this is that then we move down, you can see there's the, the image tag uh, that we have in our awesome explosion. And uh, then I can put whatever I wanted. I mentioned an ID or a class name before, uh, and we can update that in one place, which gets to the sustainability side. And then down from there, uh, this is some, uh, we use a project called Polymer to build our custom elements. There's a couple different ways to build web components, including without a library. Um, but we just like the form, the format of ours. 
Um, so it's very readable, right? I'm, I'm programming the, the awesome explosion to have a state and stopped and playing. And then you can call JavaScript from in there because these are kind of like these little micro JavaScript things that you're passing around the page. So we've been doing this a little bit, you could say, um, between the, the five members um, that have, you know, a lot of contributions to this, this, these efforts, we have 187 uh, publicly available design asset repos. That's not just design assets. Uh, we're probably pushing north of 300 web components at the moment um, that I'd say we have put out there and I'd say, this is a Drupal talk, I don't understand. Well, everything here um, works with the following because these things we're writing are against the web. They're not against anything specific. And so, you know, when we make, we're gonna to get to hacks, when we make hacks or when we make any of these design assets, we're no longer saying, oh, well, you know, I made this uh, CK editor plugin that will uh, work if the class names are correct. Like it sounds laughable compared to what these technologies allowed, or I, I made this thing for Divi, or I made this thing for the Drupal layouts module. But you have projects other than those, right? Um, and if you don't, you can't attack them because you're funneling all of your efforts into fill in the blank content management solution. Uh, so it could be any of these. Uh, in fact, we're building against these simultaneously. We're building against Drupal 6, sort of, 7, 8. Uh, we have a static site generator, hack CMS, which I just announced, uh, backdrop CMS, grab CMS, and a static, uh, or sorry, standalone desktop app. Uh, so this unlocks simultaneous cross project development because we're building against the web and then we're teaching our content management solutions about that thing that we built on the web. And so it doesn't really matter what you put here. We can put any number of these, these little silly word arts from Stranger Things. Um, so we're gonna break now for a demo and you can follow along with what I'm about to do. Uh, if you go to h-a-x-t-h-e-w-e-b.org, that's hackstheweb.org, um, then you can follow along. And so first we're going to start at uh, a design asset and see, you know, kind of how we, why, why I'm saying we're building for the web. Like, what does that mean? Um, so I have here something uh, a colleague, uh, Chuck Lavera made, works on uh, Elms. And so it's called a stop note. And a stop note is you can read the API here. It's, it's an icon, it's a title of something, and it's a URL. Pretty simple. I'm gonna hit demo. And then we can see exactly what that is. And, and you'd say, okay, well, we get to the first part of that WYSIWYG out of the anarchy journey, and so we get to templates. We could throw this in our WYSIWYG templates, right? And I'd say, yes, you can throw that in your WYSIWYG templates. It's at least one level of abstraction uh, better. However, uh, let's look at what the guts of that is, uh, that, you know, how Chuck made this little note that when we tweak the API slightly, right, and put in different values, it shows up there. So we go into uh, VS Code. Uh, we can see there's the references to other things that Chuck's using. There's the name of the thing, stop hyphen note. Then, hey, browser, when you see this, I need you to do the following. And so we've got some CSS. This isn't, you know, about CSS. Um, and then we've got the HTML, right? So we do get into, you know, the divs and the slots and, or sorry, divs and spans and things and links. Um, then, and this, you know, gets a little bit Polymer specific, but those parts of the address, right? So when he puts in URL equals, in this case, google.com, he can have his template in this custom element go, oh, you know what, the URL, if they put one, put it right here. And in fact, if they have a URL, I need you to put it right here. And so that little tiny paradigm shift is enough to give to someone else to abstract away all the complexity of rendering this correctly, right? So now uh, Chuck has tons of stop notes out there and I go, awesome, at least now we copy and paste this and we'll give this to our content contributors and go, no, we can do better than that. So if you go to hackstheweb.org, um, you can hit the edit button because otherwise it's just like a, you know, boring, silly site that I put together that has pictures of the people that work on it. So if you hit edit, uh, Hacks comes into play. And so what Hacks has done is it has figured out everything you've put on the page and then using that, those custom elements, because these are, a lot of these are just custom elements, 
uh, using data off of those custom elements, it's built an authoring experience for them. And so uh, let's, let's uh, make something, right? Let's, I'm gonna cheat for a second. Uh, there's a button under preferences. You can turn on developer mode and you can go and you can delete everything here and then you can say import text area. So you can cheat and get it back to nothing. All right, so let's make a stop note. So my users, uh, no matter what system they're using, gonna keep pointing that up, uh, are gonna go and click make and they're gonna hit the word stop and I'll see a stop note. And then, oh, there's Chuck's, there's that really cool, that cool thing. He should, he should have a job like into perpetuity. Uh, we're buddies. Uh, so what, let's, uh, you know, google.com. Okay, and it just, it just wired it up. Um, this is pretty amazing. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. Oh, oh, an icon. All right, cool. So we set the icon and I'll hit update. And um, then now it's in the page and I'm gonna turn off that uh, overlay. There we go, x-ray mode. Okay, so now I've got that stop note in the page. So you might say, what the heck was that? Okay, so if I click the stop note, see it has options, has some buttons. I can you know, kind of tweak the design of it in a minor way. Um, and I can call up this form and say, okay, but like you built, you built that authoring experience around stop notes. I don't use stop notes. And I'd say, yeah, you're right. Like I, I don't use them in all of my sites either. But the key thing with hacks this is where we start to transition out of the web components talk into what the heck is hacks, right? So if we have this standard, this web components standard, and, and so, so now we've got the sustainability and we've got the accessibility associated with that. Now these stop notes, they're, they're little baby APIs basically, and they can tell the rest of our document about them in an intelligent way. So a stop note is made up of a title, it's made up of a URL and an icon. And so the way that we interface with Hacks, Hacks doesn't know what a stop note is. This is a really important consideration of the, of the way we're building this platform. Is there's a, a lifecycle hook in custom elements called attach. There's one for, for create and there's one for ready. And so during the attached lifecycle, which is the last one, that means that it's actually been put on the page and it's printed. So think of this as like your you know, hook, uh, hook close or whatever it is in Drupal, right? The very last thing before it goes out the door. It says, hey, let's build out some hack schema. And if you read this, you'll like start to relate it to the UI. So it says, um, all right, so if you wanna make something, let's get out of that, let's go to make, make. All right, there's all these items here. And so that stop note, I filter to just stop, there we go. Stop note is orange with this little stop sign of the word stop note that comes from this little bit of metadata here. And so, hey, color, make it orange, make it have an icon that's report, uh, make the title stop note, and then the form for it, when I call this up, this form that's over here is actually from the settings defined down in this hack schema. And so we'll see title is, is a property, Give, uh, generate a text field for it, URL is a property, text field, um, there's things called slots we're not gonna get into, but it's basically the contents of an element or it's called the slot. So uh, use a code editor in order to modify the, the message area, the slot. Uh, and then I need you to have an icon picker. And the icon picker will have these three options. And so this little bit of wiring is what generates this entire form. Uh, this is, is done using something called um, JSON schema. Uh, which is a brilliantly simple little specification that is uh, an expression of the JSON that you've been sent, like how to modify it, what its types are. And that's enough information that we can wrap on top of and go, oh, well, I could build a form out of that. And so then uh, when this gets attached to the page, stop note, uh, send, uh, calls this consistent function and says, hey, Hacks, I'm gonna broadcast a message to you. And then Hacks is there listening and goes, oh, stop note, cool. All right, so that whole process, imagine we've been doing that uh, since December when I created this process. And I, I don't sleep because I have like insomnia, that's not even a joke. And uh, I eat a lot of candy, drink a lot of coffee, and there's more than just me working on this thing. Then we can change the world. So uh, what we've been able to do is just keep making stuff. And we're just making pure design assets. And those design assets can have all their logic internal to them. And then Hacks is able to go, oh, I'll just plug in and, and run that little API and now we're good. 
So if I want to embed something from Wikipedia, you know, maybe it's about uh, the Drupal project, I can do wiring between a design asset. I can know what that design asset looks like in a vacuum, regardless of systems. It's a big deal. And then I can put it in place and then throw it up the page. Um, but uh, again, I, maybe I want to go and get something. Maybe I, I, maybe I don't want to just build it right there. Maybe I could find something. Uh, well, because we're already in this decoupled type of a world where we're building out design assets and those design assets are, are then just kind of expressing themselves to hacks, you know, as far as like, oh, here's the, here's my form, right? That's, that's effectively given us an API into how to interface with these different design assets. Um, well, using JSON, I can interface with all kinds of APIs. So this is a, um, right now, it's gonna search YouTube um, and it's gonna pull results back in a consistent way. And so we'll search for Elm's Learning Network or maybe we should search for Hacks the Web, right? That's what this is about. Okay, so there's results from Hacks the Web and I can select one. And right here, Hacks has said, uh, the, in, in the case of the board, right? I make that selection. Hacks sends up a message uh, to itself more or less and says, hey, do I have anything that can present a link claiming to be video in this case? And because we've already got all these design assets that have expressed meaning to the rest of hacks, two of those design assets stand up and say, oh yeah, yeah, um, you can, I, I can handle that. And so now this is a video player that again has its form all built out that can do fun things like flip its colors excessively when the background color changes. Uh, or be automatically resp mobile responsive, or you know, have the source pre-populated from that API, so that now when I put this in the page, cool, I've got that element. Uh, and so obviously everyone on the, on the Zoom room is able to correctly, accessibly, uh, and, and citation-wise uh, reference and put YouTube videos on the web in 14 seconds, right? That's right. I mean, because I can't. I, I, I timed myself once, the fastest I could do it was uh, I think a minute and a half, and that was because I already knew, uh, you know, I had 10 years experience. Your content contributors, a lot of them don't know what the heck the web is other than this magic thing that gets constantly hacked by Russian trolls apparently. And so, okay, so we got that, but it, it's an API. So we can do other fun things that we couldn't do at the demo uh, earlier this year. I can now convert this. And this is a, an interesting little capability of hacks where it goes, hey, I've got these properties. I'm gonna kinda like, like shake the jar up and say, well, how do these spill out elsewhere? Well, I can turn that into a QR code. And so now that has remapped all of the items from the YouTube video into a QR code. Again, Hacks doesn't know what a QR code is. Hacks doesn't know what a video is. Hacks doesn't know what uh, a stop note is. It, these things have expressed themselves to Hacks so that I could go to a QR code, I could convert that and be like, ah, you know what, I want that back as a video player. There we go. And it's back as a video player. Um, I could find things all kinds of different places. If I wanted to search NASA, right? NASA is, uh, it's in the government, right? So I can type the word government, we find things from NASA. And then I've got increasingly larger subset of these items from when I rambled through this part of the talk in DrupalCon, more of the items, right? And so we can put, put that in a page. Maybe I wanna throw in some headings. Maybe I wanna put in a paragraph of text. I can't type nearly as fast so I can talk, unfortunately, right? And maybe I screw that up. Uh, I go, you know what, I wanna duplicate that paragraph. I wanna move it back up a little bit, move that heading down. I wanna change the heading into uh, a quotation. And, uh, and these get into, you know, some more normal HTML tags, right? We can do things like different size headings and all that fun stuff that no one wants to know. Um, and so, you know, basic page operations, right? We still have those things laying around. Um, some other things into hacks, I can insert an HR. I could insert a placeholder. The placeholder might be useful if I'm laying out content where I go, oh, you know, I've got uh, a video. Yeah, hey, we have a press release. and We're gonna do a video on this page, All right? But I don't have the video yet that we can throw that placeholder down. But when I get the video where I know what the link is, we'll say, I can double click this and go, hey, what do you wanna convert this into? Because again, Hacks knows I have ways of presenting things that claim to be video, and I've got a thing here claiming it wants to be a video. So I can replace that with, uh, well, it's not gonna be that link. I'm trying to find a YouTube video here. There we go. YouTube video, you know, we got a YouTube video there. All right, so uh, since April, we've also invested in uh, layouts. And so we can now 
do layouts because I guess people like layouts, but I mean, it's really important. I want everyone on the call to make sure you go out to your systems and you get the appropriate layout module and then you, you mess around with it and then you, you go through months of training and then um, the CIO says, you know, we're going to switch off of uh, Drupal 6. We're going to go to uh, uh, Backdrop um, CMS. And so I want you to be able to maintain all that knowledge instead of lose all of it because you'll never be able to explain to your content contributors other than, well, we're making this big change and so we've got to throw out everything, even the way that you did stuff. No, we don't need to do that. That can just all live in the front end now. Um, so there's a four column layout. I can come in, be like, oh, let's change that. I would have an audio file there, this image. Uh, let's edit the layout itself, right? So I go like, yeah, I want that in the second column, drop that one over here in the first column. Um, column three, we're gonna make have red or indigo on that. So I can just really lazily put that background to it. Um, hit update, cool, nothing in there. And so I could, you know, we have to work on some of the operations associated with that. Um, but I could take this placeholder for an image, maybe escalate it into a paragraph of text, double click it and turn it into a paragraph of text. Oops, I think I have to click a few times. There we go. Ugh, oh, clicking. All right, uh, maybe I could move it between columns this way instead, right? And I see those colors show up. Um, so we put a lot of work into the accessibility of this, into usability, which you know we're always investing more in, um, as well as just generally uh, kicking design assets out like it's like it's our job because it is. Um, so you know if I want a series of tabs, if I want a multiple choice question, right? You're you're able to ask all your users different questions just in context, right? So like uh, yes, so maybe the question is is hacks useful. Um, and we want to randomize those answers. Um, no. And then, you know, another potential answer is, uh, I'm not sure yet, but it's wrong. The answer is yes. So I could valid, uh, verify this in a vacuum here. Great job. Mm. Neato. And then we'll do an update. Cool. It's in the page. Let's reset that. And so now I've got hacks in the page. Oh no, better luck next time. Yes, it's awesome. Neato. Okay. So you, again, you might say, but this is for a government site. I don't, I don't need that little neato multiple choice question. And I'd say, you're right, probably. But all of these are just, it's a methodology by which we're building our design assets. And that design asset happens to have pretty advanced multiple choice type of, of functionality. Um, perhaps you have you know, a table of data that you need to put in. Right, so um, everyone likes to make accessible tables. Uh, except mine are a hundred percent accessible. Um, and most of the other ones out there probably aren't. So there's a 100% guaranteed accessible table. Uh, we can make assets for whatever we want. And that's basically you know, part of why we keep putting this out there is we're just building against the web. So we go, well, let's build a thing that can load CSV files and turn them into uh, data tables. Awesome. Tax is already there, like tax becomes the endpoint that takes like five minutes for us to wire stuff up to. And so I might go, okay, static demo. I don't care about static demo. Why is this on uh, Drupal, Drupal for Gov? I feel gypped and you go, okay, well, I'm gonna go over here. So this, maybe this looks a little bit more like Drupal. It might not because it's actually usable. Zing, sorry. Um, so this is, um, this is Elm's Learning Network's platform we work on, but it's Drupal 7 based, you know, I can cheat and there's, you know, still Drupal niceties back there. And so then it comes to training and I've trained you on this, this static page, but like you don't care, except now you do because I can easily integrate hacks into this or into just about anything. Um, because since it's following the web component methodology, it's a single tag to get it on the page. And so as long as I know the API for how to use that tag, I can integrate it into systems very rapidly. So that if I want top, you know, uh, templates, right? Those WYSIWYG templates from before, except mine are like live interactive things that you can edit and like, hey, there's that video that I just put in place and it's already there. Um, we, can, we can do that, right? If we want layouts, how do layouts work? That's not a question, right? So it's layouts work the way they're going to work everywhere. Um, so making stuff, well, I have more options here than are available on that public demo to illustrate that they're 
you can do that. Um, finding stuff, uh, I could search. Ooh, I can search the files internal to the Drupal set I'm working on. Like this, this guy. Yeah, <laughs> that guy. Oh, I gotta love him. All right, so Michael uh, P. I don't want to, you know, dox him or anything. Dox. Okay, so um, let's do. Yeah, do the hand there. Tell me more. And he likes to hang out on elmsln.org, so I can make a nice little link to that inserted in the page. Again, same UX pattern, except that image, and you're gonna have to trust me there, that image just came from Drupal. Um, but there's, oh, I got an image placeholder there, what am I gonna do? Uh, let's take that anarchy image, let's throw it in there. Oh, hey, where do you wanna save that? So in Elms Learning Network, we have two options. One of those options happens to be the Drupal site itself. One of those options happens to be a remote service. So I'm gonna save it to internal files. That just saved, uh, uploaded to my Drupal site. I wanna turn it into a meme. Ha ha, for gov. I, I did do this just to be a jerk. Obviously, I'm not an anarchist. Um, and so now we've got the anarchy logo there. I can move it around. And that just uploaded to the Drupal file system. You probably don't believe me because it happened quickly and things in Drupal don't. Again, this zings. It's really great because like no one, there's no like laugh feedback or anything. So, um, okay, so if I go to files in the Drupal file system, there is my anarchy symbol. And so this is what we're going for, is it completely decoupled and just basically using little Ajax messages and, and JSON feeds way of integrating into the system. And then say, okay, but I don't use Drupal 7, I pushed Drupal 6 before, let's go back to Drupal 6. Yes, let's see it, let's get integrated, and I can't install Drupal 6 anymore uh, because it's not worth the effort. And so you go, crap, we gotta move off of Drupal 6. You can actually install hacks in Drupal 6, it works. I showed it in April. Um, but you say, okay, well, now that it doesn't matter, right? This is really important. Um, if, if you know, user experience and content authoring is not a, a singular reason to buy or build a system, what should we adopt and why, right? So uh, maybe it's Grab CMS, which Grab CMS is uh, Symfony, it's lightweight. Um, it's just, you know, let you build pages, which are marked down and, you know, the author, oh, it's hacks. And so you could go and insert that layout, throw it in place there. Um, the file uploading part isn't on parity with the rest of it. And this is why I do these webinars because we need more people to help. Um, uh, making stuff. Hey, we can make all these things. Uh, finding stuff. Hey, you can search NASA from here. And now I'm going to show you a flaw here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so you'll see this is not a hundred percent designed the way that the other one was. Now it's pretty darn close without me doing any test. I've done literally no testing on grab. I just know that it works. Um, and so there are some little stylistic things that need to be tweaked at times um, surrounding the, the UI It's worth noting, but you know, all the core functionality, right? Those APIs to just link there, all this stuff works the same. I go, oh, I need to make the checkbox work, alt text. This is a fun little thing giving you feedback about the image. Oh, I typed the word image and it said bad, right? So a little neat little thing we can put in there so that even in areas where people need to manually jump in and write, uh, you know, alt text, we can provide feedback to them dynamically, right? Nope. And see it's updating as it goes, right? So we can put kind of program recommendations into even alt text uh, for the way it should work. The other, uh, interesting design consideration I'll say that we is intentional in building this is whenever you go to edit something that's not text, right? So it's this, there's always a settings button and there's always a fly out and then there's always a split pane. And you might go, okay, but like, wouldn't it be easier if I had a tabs to just, you know, hit the button and learn the tabs. And if you build systems, you might be right. But people that are, you know, unfamiliar to systems need an extremely consistent way of interfacing with those. So even between elements, we've effectively built a uniform way of working on no matter what the thing is, right? So it takes a little bit of time for users to get down this paradigm of like, I'm adding something, I'm finding something, or I'm making something. But once you get down that that's the way to interface with this, you know how to use it every time. So if it says it's multiple choice, you know it's gonna be this way, you know there's gonna be buttons like this. Uh, if it's a, a license, you know it's gonna be like this. Um, I'm not gonna go into deep detail on the Drupal site integrations of these, but we do have 
um, some Drupal specific tags that are able to render, you know, tokens and things, render views in place, render blocks in place. Um, there's some other videos you can watch for that. I don't want to get hung up on there. So maybe you didn't move to grab again, all options are on the table. Maybe you moved to backdrop and maybe you wanted to do training on the experience. And this one is a little goofy, right? So like I'm showing the flaws on purpose, but it, you know, if I tweak whatever that font size issue is, then I'll have the same, right? So let's search for Drupal. There we go. There's Drupal embed my Drupal Wikipedia article. And so I definitely still need to, need to clean that up a little bit. Here's the biggie though, then uh, this is different from in April. In April, this did not exist. And then because we had a talk and I think whoever approved the talk to go through, um, ASU got involved. Uh, Michael Samuelson from there, got to give him mad props on this. He got a hacks Drupal 8 module in place. I just updated it today uh, to be on feature parity with Drupal 7 pretty much. And so I'm in Drupal 8, I get this new tab, hacks mode. Hey, there's my layout, there's my video, do my responsive video and no longer need a responsive video module. Um, throw in another layout, that's a different shape. Go and find something, maybe search Wikipedia uh, for US government. All right, so there's articles that reference US government. Again, there's a little bit of you know, stylistic thing I need to account for there. Federal government of the United States was a Wikipedia article. Cool, it's in place and it's properly accessibly cited and will self update. Um, this is not something you're gonna find anywhere else on the web. And then I'm gonna hit save and go back and view this page. And here it is without hacks. And so this is another really important consideration of hacks. Uh, we, as a development team, want this stuff to either have been built with hacks or without hacks and still coexist. We don't want hacks to be a requirement for this to operate. And so by going and edit it, um, I think there's a few source, there we go. There we go. You can see the video hyphen player tag that was put in the page. You can see the grid plates, you can see the Wikipedia query. And so we've worked uh, painstakingly at times to get it so that everything that goes into the DOM and then comes back out to be saved as a, just a blob of text is identical to what any of us could have typed by hand. And I mean, that's, that's part of what we're going for with it. So, you know, if you don't like backdrop, if you don't like Drupal 8, if you don't like grab, we're gonna have to find other systems. If you don't like Drupal 6, I'm, I'm sorry, it's like the best system ever made. Um, so this is something I've been rambling about. You're the first to see it here. So this is something called Hack CMS. And I'm not expecting you to adopt Hack CMS. I'm just trying to drive home the, this, this point of how much you can work on simultaneously as a result of this technology uh, of web components. Because things like form input are assumed, right? If I want a color picker, I already showed you a whole bunch. So now I have a single tag that I put a color picker down um, on the stuff here. Uh, an icon picker, again, that, that's already assumed, right? So it's not, it's not like copy and paste, oh, and then I've kind of learned the lessons of the past. It's no, I'm literally repurposing everything I've ever used as a developer. Uh, so there's that magazine cover that I put Mike on before. Uh, there's the link that goes to the right place. Open it up, what did this just do? In the case of Hack CMS, you gave me this hideous fuchsia thing because this is highly experimental, but, uh, I wanna hit, oh, there's hacks. Or maybe uh, edit an outline, right? And so maybe we want to be able to just type, like why do our users need to understand how to go places and do stuff, right? So part of what we're, part of what we're working on this for is uh, almost like a rapid prototype, early development type of a tool, right? Because there's a lot of times pre-site going out the door, that it would be great to be able to have a tool to build stuff out quickly. Um, and just be able to get an impression of what that content might be, right? So that I might be able to go make something and throw in math or throw in that meme and you know make fun of something um, or go to YouTube just like the other place, right? And throw down an Eminem video and put it as a QR code, right? So if I could start to use hacks as like a rapid prototyping tool, um, it's contents that it's creating are in a format that I am guaranteed to work at the end, but I've also trained my users in this like kind of safe space, right? That is, um, that is in a vacuum, it's a, it's a little standalone thing. Um, maybe it could work on a desktop, but I mean, we, our team is too small to be able to work on this hacks that, 
it hacks the web desktop app that I have here. And I'm gonna click Aperio 18, and there's a similar outline manipulation tool, more things. And then I could save, we could go into space travel and the more things, and I could give you an identical content authoring experience that I could hammer in that three column or four column layout, and I could throw down an Elms LN logo, except apparently I, I broke that part from working. <laughs> but that's the idea is that we could kind of, you know, we've, once you've learned this pattern, um, it's so easy to integrate into things that it's kind of unbelievable. I mean, it's really unbelievable. Most of what I do when talking about web components and hacks is just kind of keep reiterating that it's even possible. And so um, we've, we've effectively ended the, the hunt for there's, is there a module for whatever I'm about to say um, as a result of this technology. Um, so we've deleted 20, I, when I wrote this slide before, I'd say it's up to almost 30 modules at this point that we've deleted as a result of just not needing all those little like, widget, widgety modules all over the place. And we're going to keep deleting them. Uh, I mentioned SAS. We blew away 100,000 lines of SAS. I actually had one commit that had like 800,000 line changes um, because of this type of a thing, right? We're throwing out the way we used to assemble all these assets and doing it in a much more efficient manner. Um, you can use SAS, but we just don't. And so we're much more dependent on now, like there's a web component for that. So when I'm building Hack CMS, I go and look for web components. And those web components could have been repurposed completely from Elms or from just any generic uh, Drupal site. So if I could leave you with one thing, is that let's, uh, let's work together no matter what system we end up choosing. We're all wasting a lot of effort in this like toddler parallel play where like I'm building a Drupal 7 and you're building a Drupal 8 and you're building Grab CMS, but we're all web developers and we're all doing more or less the same thing. Uh, but think of what we could build when we did the same thing. And so uh, everything should be your back end, whether it's Drupal or otherwise. And so that's really the end of the real hacks sales pitch. And so if you want to learn more about the project or what we're up to, uh, I'm more or less live streaming consciousness at, at BTO Pro on Twitter. Uh, ElmsLN.org is where you can learn about Elms. Um, HacksTheWeb.org is the address of what you just saw. And so from there, you know, open up to, to questions if anyone has any. Opening the chat. Uh, looking through the chat. If anybody has a question and they're unable to unmute themselves, um, just raise your hand and I'll unmute you. I, or I can ask uh, Brian to globally unmute everybody, but. Globally unmute everybody. I don't know where that button is. I don't know. I thought there was, but. It might be. Is there a timeline for upgrading to Polymer 1? So I'm just reading the, uh, the, the chat box. Um, you mean, so I'll ask, uh, is there a way I can unmute Wade so I can just talk to Wade? That would be a lot easier. Um, do you mean like uh, like for our project or for just using it in general? Uh, I mean for using it in general. Um, uh, so um, Polymer 3 uh, came out, uh, I want to say in May. Um, and Polymer 3 switches the build routine pretty substantially. Uh, so it puts it in line with the way other, a lot of other projects like React and, and Vue have been operating. Um, so it uses NPM uh, instead of Bower. Bower's a deprecated uh, package management solution. Um, as far as from our team, I'm, I'm personally waiting until uh, Firefox no longer requires polyfills to even explore that. And so Firefox is supposed to uh, not require polyfills to, to run web components. Um, sometime around late October, we should see that drop. Um, and so that would be when I'm going to at least start to, to look at it. Um, with Polymer 3, it's, it's an important thing to note is um, the Polymer team uh, is not actually writing stuff in Polymer 3. They've written a project called Modularizer that will take and progressively escalate their Polymer uh, 1 and 2 elements to work with 3. Um, so it was an, another reason we picked Polymer is because it's kind of this self-replacing 
framework. It doesn't increase in functionality. It decreases in functionality every, you know, every release. Um, and Polymer 3 will actually be the last one after that. They're going to um, even more lightweight things. So <clears throat> another question, Drupal can structure data into content types and fields. How do you deal with this in hacks? Uh, so I'm not sure if I have a video of it. I don't typically enjoy, I don't, I don't wanna go to something in production since this is recorded, um, uh, but we do have a workflow with uh, stuff that has been created uh, in an asset management system. So that's um, a Drupal-based system. And it's just, it's um, presenting, presenting its content from a back end. Kind of think of it as like a, a web call goes out the door via token. And then that token is interpreted and it renders a thing and puts it in the page. So that is highly structured content that we're doing in, in the Elms LN. Um, so um, in that case, we've got a CMS token tag that that token is in the content. You uh, click and then we've got a way of broker brokering it. So you hit like edit this thing and it pops open a new window just to the edit form. Um, that is obviously less ideal than, than what you're describing. So that starts to be become uh, uh, an important question is like where, where do you need to structure advanced content? Because um, you absolutely still need to do that. Um, so hacks gives you another option when instead of get, you know boiling down to that dreaded content area, right? Because even if you have highly structured content, a lot of times it's going to have a content area. Um, so at the moment we kind of have these two these two forms. We've got the the legacy form that kind of has our structured material because Elms has structured material in it, and then we've got um, the hacks capable authoring thing. I'm going to imagine that you're going to um, you would eliminate certain connections that you're currently making in the name of like, well, we've got to render that file here, or I need to keep tabs of, of these things with that. Um, but that is certainly, certainly something, you know, we're thinking of going into the future. Um, uh, JSON schema is also another potential solution for us in this regard, because JSON schema allows you to, uh, if you have that structure of the material, you can kind of, um, you can kick it out kick out a form from it, right? So we could use our web components to render that form and maybe have more advanced material, but, but definitely, uh, definitely kind of open-ended my answer there. <laughs> so uh, Brian, this is Jessica, I have a question. If I have a relatively robust Drupal 7 site, you know, with couple of different content types and we're doing our evaluation as we start thinking about either migrating to Drupal 8 or simply doing a, a real refresh on what we've got on Drupal 7. And one of the biggest things we've talked about is getting rid of that body field specifically for our editors and paragraphs is kind of what folks were leaning to. But is this something that you can easily integrate with something that's already been built out or is this something depending on how complex your site is, you, it's better when you're starting over um so if you have a so if you have a body field mess right now um then this is something you could definitely drop in and see if it's see if it's for you i wouldn't you know go dropping it in on production um, <laughs> no. um you know just all willy-nilly but um because i mean it does handle content differently but we've designed it to be able to edit more or less just edit html uh because we already had a lot of content that was already just in the body field. Um, so at least as far as like me, like I, I've been told that this is one of the most like worldview challenging types of, of things being that's, that's actually kind of more the starting point in my mind is to go like, what, what do we lose when we highly structure our content? Um, because I started down the field collections route. I raved about it and love field collections. And then someone asked me to get their material back out in a format that wasn't Drupal. And I went, uh, oh. <laughs> um, so I'd say I'd, it, it's definitely possible as like a you know replacement option to the the panels thing. It's also a matter of like um, if you buy into web components, this then becomes more appealing. So I'd say you definitely should be looking at web components um, for any redesign, uh, even if it's just a single asset on the page just, you know, and you need something to play with and you're gonna to have to design it anyway, um, it's worth giving it a try as a web component 
um, because it, it just really, once you buy into the approach, you can start to build things, you know, as if it's Legos, which is why all the little silly Lego people. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions from the group, either in chat or on the phone? We're a few minutes over, but if, if Brian's good, then, uh, then we are. Uh, I see there's one in the chat, Brian. Oh, I see that, Tom. <laughs> um, let's see. It, hi, I'm a new Drupal dev, and I have a Drupal 8. I don't even know what to say. Okay, so how hard will it be to just drop hacks in and play around with it in Drupal 8? Um, so I have never installed it before, and I got it working today in about uh, five minutes. If I never installed it before, I mean, I've never gotten Drupal 8 installed before. Um, so the module is all self-contained. Um, with the exception of you need to um, uh, get the assets in place for it to load. So they need to go in like libraries, um, libraries, web components type of thing. It's in the documentation for it. Um, we are looking for contributions to help get it to be a, um, a CDN based solution. It's another, another aspect of web components that um, becomes incredibly appealing is the fact that you can load all your assets over a CDN uh, and they just work. So the demo I did in April, I, I inject assets from a CDN into like CNN.com or something silly um, and, and start using hacks there. Uh, it's not so much the trick being hacks, it's that web components, because if you can teach the browser you're viewing the definition of the thing, it kind of comes to life. And so we're looking to build um, or incorporate a zero config uh, option for D8. So for right now, you have to get the module in a, in a Drupal 8 site and you have to um, uh, get the assets in place. But it's, it's definitely to a level, I just published an alpha two today and that's what you just saw. Um, so it's definitely to a level where it's at least, you know, play around with it pretty quickly. This is a quantum shift. Well, thank you, I think. Um, if, uh, if you mean Gutenberg, then uh, uh, Gutenberg, I would look highly at the, the output of Gutenberg. It's one of the reasons uh, why we made certain decisions we did. I, I don't care for the way that Gutenberg stores its content, unfortunately, but hopefully it'll be you know, similar. Hopefully we can have the Gutenberg for Drupal type of thing. Um, and as Kirsten put in the, in the chat, I have a talk on this um, both at GovCon and at Decoupled Dev Days uh, coming up. Um, so if you are going to either of those and you want to catch up in person or um, want to get more involved, um, uh, we put on trainings all the time on how to you know, build web components even um, because it, it, it really is a mind shift entirely to a different way of, of uh, building stuff out on the web. Um, but it's completely worth it, I assure you. Hacks or otherwise, you, you need to adopt web components. <laughs> I assume you mean do a boff. Yeah, we could do a boff. <laughs> cool. Any other questions? Okay. Well, if there are no more questions, Brian, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, for all of you on the call, we'll be sending out a follow on email with just a little short survey. Let us know what you thought about the topic, what other things you'd like to hear from. And yes, I highly encourage you guys. Um, I don't know about you guys. This, this looks awesome to me. I'm, I'm a little overwhelmed, but excited at the same time. So um, hopefully if you want to learn more, you'll be able to catch up with Brian at Drupal GovCon. We'll see you there. And if you need to reach us for anything at any time, you can hit us up uh, on Twitter at GovDrupal or the uh, our Gmail Drupal for gov at gmail.com. Thanks, everybody. Um, Brian, please hit uh, stop recording so, so that I don't get a bunch of dead time. Nailed it. <laughs> so 